One of the most important questions of our life, and one of the themes that is really starting to emerge from these episodes of the podcast is, what is this other force living in our brain that seems to work against some of the things that we say we want in life? Why do we do things that make us unhappy? Or why do we lean into stresses? Why don't we change ourselves in the way we want to change ourselves? It's come up in some form in almost every episode so far. We talked about it in Straw Dogs, this conflict between our inability to be idle and appreciate the world and accept some of our mortality. We need to always be busying and distracting ourselves. Obviously, Nietzsche talked about it in Zarathustra, the uh, difference between being comfortable in mediocrity and striving for greatness. We talked about it in Finite and Infinite Games. Montaigne talked about it in his essays. We covered it fairly extensively last week in The Denial of Death and how we choose to live a shallower life instead of going after our, our fullest existence. It's such an interesting question to me because I feel like at least today we live under this somewhat grand illusion that we are just in control of ourselves and our lives and all of the problems are external to us. Things in our environment need to change when often so many of our problems do stem from internal uh, conflicts or inability to actually follow through or do or affect the kinds of things that we want to change in ourselves. And many of the books have been stating that that uh, conflict exists, talking about why it might exist. But today we're going to take a different tack, which is recognizing it exists how do we try to overcome it in one very, very important area, which is doing our best work? If you accept the premise from Denial of Death last week that we are uh, often sh shrinking away from our greatest life, from our greatest existence, because we are terrified of what living our fullest potential would do to us, then you might say, OK, I, I'm going to recognize that I'm terrified of going after this thing because if I fail at it, it will mean I fail as a person. I'll be it's psychologically destroyed, but I, I'm going to dive into it anyway. I'm going to go after it. Well, you're still going to get in your own way. And how do we overcome those obstacles? How do we get out of our own way? How do we do that best work despite these parts of our brain that are working against us? Well, there are a lot of books that talk about this topic in various different forms, but this is easily one of the best and most recommended, which is The War of Art. And this is a fun uh, divergence from some of the books we've done recently, since so many of the books are older, philosophical, uh, very like high production value. I mean, it's just worth taking a moment to look at. This is uh, seemingly self-published, maybe, or, or some sort of uh, simpler publishing setup. It's got the kind of telltale crease along the spine. Some of the page layouts are funny, but it's possibly the most recommended book on this subject. And it's really just like packed full of fantastic information for how you can actually deal with getting out of your own way. And that's why it's recommended so heavily. I've read it quite a few times, uh, refer back to the ideas in it regularly. And it is, I think, really one of the best resources for tactically uh, fighting against the, the worst of our self-destructive, self-obstructing nature. Uh, but it, it has an equally valuable companion. So we have The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, and then we have his follow-on book, Turning Pro. And it's kind of uh, funny if you look at how these came about, because in The War of Art, he lays out the problem, and then at the end of the book, he talks about uh, overcoming it uh, and what he calls Turning Pro. And then I guess he decided he didn't do a good enough job and wrote a whole other book expanding on what was in that second section. So I, I'm going to treat them as an essential pair because I do think that you really should just go from one straight into the next. So they're, they're a fantastic duo. Uh, and they do provide, I think, one of the best lifelong remedies to solving this problem of recognizing that there is this part of our brain that's working against us. But we want to be self-actualized creative humans. And uh, to do that, we need good tools to attack it with. And uh, these are some of the best tools I've found. So we're going to dive into them. I'm going to go through how he conceptualizes the problem, how he believes we can attack it. Uh, some of my favorite ideas, we're obviously going to tie it in to all the other books that we've talked about, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. So if you want to do your best work, whether you've read these books or not, then this is the episode for you. Let's start with what is the war of art? And I will just read you this passage from the intro because I think it encapsulates it the best. Most of us have two lives, the life we live and the unlived life within us. 
Between the two stands resistance. Have you ever brought home a treadmill and let it gather dust in the attic? Ever quit a diet, a course of yoga, a meditation practice? Have you ever bailed out on a call to embark upon a spiritual practice, dedicate yourself to a humanitarian calling, commit your life to the service of others? Have you ever wanted to be a mother, a doctor, an advocate for the weak and helpless, to run for office, crusade for the planet, campaign for world peace, or to preserve the environment? Late at night, have you experienced a vision of the person you might become, the work you could accomplish, the realized being you were meant to be? Are you a writer who doesn't write, a painter who doesn't paint, an entrepreneur who never starts a venture? Then you know what resistance is. So this is the war of art, as Pressfield is describing it, is that we have this real life that we are exhibiting and we have this unlived life that we can each imagine. I've, I don't think I've mentioned this on the show before, but I've referred back to it often that one of my favorite conceptions of what hell might look like is simply meeting the person you could have been had you fully followed through on all the things that you said and wish you would do. And that person is, it should be kind of scary for most of us to imagine. I don't think any of us are living that fully idealized, actualized self. And sometimes imagining that person can be quite scary because it requires acknowledging that we have failed to live up to that ideal in various parts of our lives. And each of us probably is failing in some way to be that person. We could be excellent in work, but uh, not as nurturing or present in our families. We could be wonderful in our families, but uh, lack ambition to create something uh, beyond ourselves for others. Uh, there, there are so many ways that we could not be uh, living up to that imagined life. And often we don't want to think about it because of how depressing or scary it can be. What Pressfield is saying here is that we all have that light. We all have that existence we can imagine. And that's okay. It's fine that this greater image of yourself exists. We need to recognize it and then recognize the force that is standing in between us and that life. And he coins uh, the term resistance to describe this force. But resistance is really the same thing we've been talking about through all these other philosophy books as well. It is that strange hidden energy inside of our brains that is constantly kind of getting in our way, stopping us, holding it back. Uh, and so he's going to, but it can be very helpful to personify it like this and to see where it emerges in each of our lives. And here's where this book ties in really beautifully with when we read Denial of Death last week. Uh, the foreword is written by Robert McKee, and he says, uh, To begin book one, Pressfield labels the enemy of creativity resistance, his all-encompassing term for what Freud called the death wish, that destructive force inside human nature that rises whenever we consider a tough long-term course of action that might do for us or others something that's actually good. And I love this conception of the death wish, too. There's so many different ways to look at this idea. And thinking of it as a death wish, where there is this subtle way in which we are wishing for our own death or failure, at least in, in this creative, self-fulfilled way. Right? It's interesting how many of us turn to forms of indulgence or, for lack of a better term, for lack of a better term, self-harm, and not in the like physical sense directly, but in the like alcohol, smoking, drugs, even sloth and inactivity, right? Like we default to uh, doing things that harm us when we don't want to deal with the reality uh, that we are in. We all have this death wish inside of us. And resistance is, is such a great way to personify that. And to be clear, resistance is not just a work thing. Pressfield gives uh, a list of resistance's greatest hits, the many ways that resistance rears its ugly head. He says, the following is a list in no particular order of those activities that most commonly elicit resistance. The pursuit of any calling in writing, painting, music, film, dance, or any creative act, however marginal or unconventional. The launching of any entrepreneurial venture or enterprise for profit or otherwise. Any diet or health regimen. Any program of spiritual advancement. Any activity whose aim is tighter abdominals. Any course or program designed to overcome an unwholesome habit or addiction. Education of every kind. Any act of political, moral, or ethical courage. Uh, the undertaking of any enterprise or endeavor whose aim is to help others. Any act that entails commitment of the heart. The decision to get married, to have a child, to weather a rocky patch in a relationship. The taking of any principled stand in the face of adversity. In other words, any act that rejects immediate gratification in favor of long-term growth, health, or integrity. Or expressed another way, any act that derives from our higher nature instead of our lower. Any of these will elicit resistance. And so there are some clues here about where this crops up. And many of them are going to be familiar, right? Anytime you are 
sticking your neck out from the herd, there's going to be some resistance to that anytime you are choosing to forego short-term satisfaction for a long-term benefit, there's going to be some resistance. And it's interesting to think, and this is talked about a little bit in denial of death, but many of these instances of resistance are not necessarily illogical or bad. In some ways, we're fighting our natural animal instincts because the, the, the natural animal instincts inside of us would want to say, well, no, we should just eat all of the berries that are in front of us because we want as many calories as possible because we don't know how many we'll find tomorrow. We don't want to take a, a long-term risk with our work where there might not be a clear big payoff in the end if we can just make you know, a safe, comfortable living right now. We don't want to stand up to some adversity or some illegitimate authority because that could uh, cause some short-term harm for us or even get us rejected by the group. All of these reactions are kind of natural. You can see where the resistance comes from, but we still have to fight it nonetheless. And this is one of the other really important, interesting, and honestly useful aspects of resistance is that whenever we encounter it, it's often a sign that we are actually approaching something that might be long-term good for us. A little bit later on, he says, we can use it as a compass. We can navigate by resistance, letting it guide us to that calling or action that we must follow before all others. The more important a call or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. So it, in some ways, you can see resistance as it's bad. It's letting me give in. It's letting me give up. It's letting me avoid doing the things I want to do, but it's also good because when you're thinking about what you want to do, if you instinctually recoil from one of the things you're considering because of some manufactured reason, like, oh, I don't have time, I don't have the resources, oh, that's risky, that's scary, what will my friends, family, group, whatever, think of me, that might be the thing that you need to go do, right? That, that can be a very helpful guide. Whichever thing you are thinking of doing that elicits the most resistance, that might be the one that you need to do most. And it's not just useful as a guide for deciding what to do. It can also be useful as a guide in how you need to focus your energy in what you're already doing. Because in particular, resistance is going to get strongest the closer you are to success. That's why it's very tempting to self-sabotage toward the end of a project, either by just like throwing it out half finished or abandoning it completely, thinking that it's not good enough. Pressfield says, the danger is greatest when the finish line is in sight. At this point, resistance knows we are about to beat it. It hits the panic button. It marshals one last assault and slams us with everything it's got. The professional must be alert for this counterattack. Be wary at the end. You, you can almost think that uh, resistance in any project, work, uh, creative act it is almost like the rising tension of a story. It, there's going to be some little peak at the beginning, right? There's going to be something you have to get through to get started. But then once you get started, it kind of goes away because, OK, you know, I, I've gotten I've gotten past that first hurdle. I'm in the belly of the beast. I'm making progress. And then as you go and you get closer to finishing, you get closer to success, it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. It's going to get bigger and bigger. The, the tension is going to increase until it hits that climax right at the end. And you have to get through that peak of resistance if you want to make it to the other side, if you want to finish something great or that you're really proud of. And so it's, again, it's not just helpful for deciding what to do, but also for recognizing in what we are doing that the closer we get to succeeding at it, the more and more resistance we are going to start to feel. And with that explanation, with that example, it's tempting to think of resistance as procrastination, but it's it's a lot more than that. It's really any kind of self-sabotage. Procrastination is, is an obvious one that a lot of us will naturally try to attack because it's the one that maybe gets talked about the most, but there are there are so many ways that uh, resistance can uh, kind of like rear its ugly head. So some other examples he gives are that we can like create trouble for ourselves. We can create problems in our life to distract us from the thing that uh, we know we should be doing. Right? We'll create these other issues to go deal with instead of working on the the big hard thing that we're afraid of. We can obviously self medicate in various ways, so alcohol and other drugs, but also. Television and video games is a lot of different ways to, to self-medicate or even positive forms of self-medication where we take up an obsessive exercise routine, again, as a way to distract us from the more important work that we want to be doing or that we think we want to be doing anyway. We could treat ourselves like a victim, right? Like nothing is ever going to work out for us. Uh, things are 
uh, it's always going to fail. So why bother trying or why bother even starting to try? Another interesting way it can manifest that he talks about is criticism. If you find yourself drawn to criticize other people, that is often coming from a place of resistance. It's coming from a sense that this other person is living up to fulfilling their actualized self. They are doing their work and you are not. And so in order to make yourself feel better, you need to tear them down in some way. You can often try to look for who you criticize and why you criticize them and ask yourself if maybe you are criticizing them out of a place of insecurity about not uh, living up to yourself in the way that they might be living up to themselves. He has this great line where he says, individuals who are realized in their own lives almost never criticize others. If they speak at all, it is to offer encouragement. Watch yourself of all the manifestations of resistance most only harm ourselves. Criticism and cruelty harm others. And that can be helpful in reverse too, where if somebody's being very critical of you or being very critical of your work, you can often lighten the blow by telling yourself, reminding yourself that they are probably being so critical out of a place of insecurity. It is coming from them being unhappy with their own life or their own work in some way. And so they feel the need to attack you and yours instead. And that can help, right? It might not uh, dull the blow entirely, but it can take some of the edge off. And then there are the many ways that we convince ourselves we're not ready as a form of resistance. So an easy one is researching, right? We think we need to go collect tons of information. We need to go uh, do more prep work, take more courses, read more books, whatever, before we get started. And that is pretty often just a form of procrastination. There, there's usual error because we're afraid of doing the work, so we want to go do more research first. It's a lot easier to read another book about writing than to sit down and write a book. And he also has this uh, really interesting call out about resistance and healing. And I'll just read you this section. Have you ever spent time in Santa Fe? There's a subculture of healing there. The idea is that there's something therapeutic in the atmosphere, a safe place to go and get yourself together. There are other places, usually populated by upper middle class people with more time and money that they know what to do with, in which a culture of healing also obtains. The concept in all these environments seems to be that one needs to complete his healing before he is ready to do his work. This way of thinking is a form of resistance. What are we trying to heal anyway? The athlete knows the day will never come when he wakes up pain-free. He has to play hurt. Remember, the part of us that we imagine needs healing is not the part we create from. That part is far deeper and stronger. The part we create from can't be touched by anything our parents did or society did. That part is unsullied, uncorrupted, soundproof, waterproof, and bulletproof. In fact, the more troubles we've got, the better and richer that part becomes. And I love this because I, I feel like today there's such this strong uh, mythology around, oh, uh, healing, doing the work, right? I need to like do all of this therapy and do all of these like camps and conferences and read all these books and listen to all these podcasts and blah, blah, blah before I'm like, ready to take this next phase of my life. And most of that stuff is just procrastination, is just hiding from actually uh, doing the thing that you really know you need to do, right? It's, it's an excuse for inaction, right? We treat ourselves like infants uh, in order to give ourselves an excuse to not make changes in our lives. And so that can be a particularly nefarious one because you kind of get rewarded. You get a lot of validation for uh, for doing this like healing focus for saying like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm taking time for myself, right? Like I'm, I'm working through some stuff, but all of those excuses for not doing the other thing that you are doing that instead of doing, right? And if he, he does make a really great point, right? The more troubles we've got, the better and richer that part becomes. So we have to be extra careful that we don't do these societally, societally rewarded things as a way to procrastinate on our work. And when I say our work, I don't mean our job, right? I mean, whatever it is that you know deep down you need to do or should be doing that you are probably not doing if you were doing all these other things, right? This is one of the greatest challenges of life is figuring out what that work is for ourselves and then committing to doing it, right? It's that two-part process of identifying it and then actually beginning it, overcoming all of these forces of resistance. So that's what I mean when I say work. The other really interesting one he mentions here is support, support from others. And this tendency to uh, try to get help from peers, go to workshops, join clubs, uh, take classes, uh, go back to school, right? Like we think that we need other people to help us in order to uh, overcome resistance and do our work. But that is itself a form of resistance. It is another excuse. If we're telling ourselves, oh, I need to 
find a mentor, I need to find a writing coach, I need to find a, a buddy to do this with, then we are, again, just procrastinating uh, on getting started. I love the way you put this. Seeking support for your friends and family is like having your people gathered around at your deathbed. It's nice, but when the ship sails, all they can do is stand on the dock and wave goodbye. Any support we get from persons of flesh and blood is like monopoly money. It's not legal tender in that sphere where we have to do our work. In fact, the more energy we spend stoking up on support from colleagues and loved ones, the weaker we become and the less capable of handling our business. And this is another great tie into the dial of death last week and this idea of transference, right? You, you think of a child and a child might have their, their blanket or their little dinosaur and they're transferring some of their security onto that. It's like their object, right? Or they're relying on their parents for some of their security, their teachers, maybe some of their peers. And that's a natural thing for a child to do. But part of becoming an adult is moving that locus of confidence internal, no longer relying on the people around you to provide you your sense of competence and self-worth. It doesn't mean that you should be alone. It doesn't mean you shouldn't love people and uh, have people who love you. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to rely on people for emotional support. But if you are constantly needing them in order to do this work, if you are constantly looking for support, if you need that external validation, then uh, you will never be a fully secure person. You'll never be able to like really break through these forces of resistance that are holding you back from living that best self, living that best life. And he gives a number of other examples and discussions about what constitutes resistance, where it comes from, but I, I feel like you probably get it at this point. <laughs> uh, the most important thing is that he then explains resistance can be beat. It shows up in all these ways. We seek it out in all these ways. We lean into it. We let it overtake us, but we can defeat it. And here's how. And this is where I basically switch from the War of Art to Turning Pro, because the second section of War of Art is called Turning Pro, and then he expands on it so much in the second book that I think just going to the Turning Pro book is perhaps the better move anyway. And before we dive into that, I just want to remind you about Readwise. So Readwise is my absolute favorite reading tool. I use it for every book that I cover on the show and basically every book that I read. It makes it super easy to organize all of my highlights and everything that I'm learning from each book. It has a fantastic scanner for pulling notes out of physical books if you prefer to read physical like I do. Uh, and then it can also pull notes or it can also pull highlights from uh, anything that you're reading online, any articles, any ebooks, uh, PDFs even. You can pull them all into the Readwise Reader, which is like the best version of uh, an online article reader that I've tried way better than Instapaper, Pocket, all of those. Uh, and then it sends everything to your note-taking app of choice if you use Evernote, Notion, Realm, whatnot, uh, so that you can go through all of your highlights whenever you need them. I use it every day. It is fantastic. If you go to readwise.io slash nat, you can get a 60-day free trial uh, and see how you like it yourself. So please be sure to check that out for the show. It's readwise.io slash nat. All right, let's talk about turning pro. Pressfield's going to say that the way we fight resistance is a thorough change in how we approach life. Giving into resistance is being an amateur and we need to be professionals. The thesis of this book is that what ails you and me has nothing to do with being sick or wrong. What ails us is that we are living our lives as amateurs. The solution is that we turn pro. Turning pro is free, but it's not easy. You don't need to take a course or buy a product. All you need to do is change your mind. Now, before we go on, I think it's important to highlight how this might be right or wrong. Really, the, the problem of this duality of our mind, this war with ourselves, has plagued philosophy, psychology, every aspect of studying the human brain for really all of time. There obviously is not an easy solution, right? The books come out every week that seek to address this problem in some way. Books on how to lose weight, how to wake up early, how to you know write the best book ever, how to turn pro, and Humans don't seem to be getting that much better, <laughs> right? It's, it's not like uh, once a few diet books came out, we all magically stopped being obese, right? Like obesity has gone up. Uh, it's not like we've all stopped drinking alcohol. Alcohol consumption has basically stayed flat or gone up, right? Like addictive substances, uh, we seem to do a lot of those. We're not super active, right? Like this stuff clearly doesn't work in general. And we clearly still have these struggles as humans. And most people who read these books are probably not actually going to get that much better at fighting this part of their brain, but these tools are quite good. 
Uh, and if you can remember them and use them, then I think you stand a better chance than if you are just trying to uh, fight yourself uh, with, with no weapons, with no tools. So I, I really like this framework because it does give us some easy ways to try to shift our mindset a little bit so that we stand a better chance uh, fighting against this resistance. So Pressfield says there are broadly two ways that we live as amateurs, that we avoid going after our best work, that we get in our own way, that we let resistance win. And the, the first one is is kind of sneaky. It's subtle. It's one that you might not think of, one that I, I find often elicits the greatest like aha moments in people. Pressfield says sometimes when we are afraid of embracing our true calling, we'll pursue a shadow calling instead. That shadow career is a metaphor for our real career. Its shape is similar. Its contours feel tantalizingly the same. But a shadow career entails no real risk. If we fail at a shadow career, the consequences are meaningless to us. Are you pursuing a shadow career? Are you getting your PhD in Elizabethan studies because you're afraid to write the tragedies and comedies that you know you have inside you? Are you living the drugs and booze half of the mus musician's life without actually writing the music? Are you working in a support capacity for an innovator because you're afraid to risk becoming an innovator yourself? If you are dissatisfied with your current life, ask yourself what your current life is a metaphor for. That metaphor will point you towards your true calling. And this is such a beautiful way to capture it, right? So many of us get sucked into this lesser version of the career that we ideally want to do uh, because we are afraid of living that greatest life. It is the Jonah syndrome that we talked about in the denial of death episode. And the, the shadow career is so tricky because it's it's really easy for us to fool ourselves to thinking that, oh, uh, well, no, I, I, I am like doing the thing that I love because I'm getting my PhD in Elizabethan studies. But really, like you want to be writing the tragedies and comedies that you're studying. The sinister version of this I see is people who really want to write books, but who are just writing Twitter threads and newsletters. And I've been one of those people. And it's tough when uh, that gets rewarded very quickly and when you can make good money doing it. But it is still a shadow of that career that you actually want. And obviously, even within what you might think is the more actualized version of the career, there could be uh, subtle forms of this, right? Like the fiction writer who only writes genre pulpy fiction instead of the more literary fiction they really want to write really, there's so many ways for a shadow career to manifest that is something we really really have to watch out for and be careful of but but the second way that we give in is through addictions of various kinds we might be in a shadow career and have an addiction we might say we're making progress on a real career and be giving into some addiction instead and I love how he describes how we end up in these addictions. The pre-addictive individual, you and I when we're young, experiences a calling to art, to service, to honorable sacrifice. In other words, we experience positive aspiration, a vision of the higher realized self we might become. Yeah, the intimation of this calling is followed immediately by the apparition of resistance, fear, self-doubt, self-sabotage. What makes this moment so soul precarious is that most of us are unconscious in the event of both our aspirations and our resistance. We are asleep. We know only that something is wrong and we don't know how to fix it. We are restless. We're bored. We're angry. We burn to accomplish something great, but we don't know where to begin. And even if we did, we'd be so terrified that we still couldn't take a step. Enter a drink, a lover, a habit. Addiction replaces aspiration. The quick fix wins out over the slow haul. So we, there's this, this arc that happens. We feel some calling to something and then we might very briefly strive after it, but we're not ready. We don't know how to fight with the resistance yet. So we run into the first obstacle and then we say, ah, okay, like I can't do this. Like I have to let it go. And we give up and then we find some way to, to numb that pain, to numb that sense that something is wrong. And that is where these these addictions, these bad habits can come into play. And kind of like resistance and like shadow careers, addictions it can be a useful lens, right? He says, addictions are not bad. They are simply the shadow forms of a more noble and exalted calling. Our addictions are our callings themselves, only encrypted and incognito. They are a metaphor for our best selves, the coded version of our higher aspirations. Addictions and shadow careers are messages in a bottle from our unconscious. Our self, in the Jungian sense, is trying to get our attention to have an intervention with us. The question we need to ask of shadow career or an addiction is the same question the psychotherapist asks of a dream. What is our unconscious trying to tell us? And so you might be able to look at your addictions, at the ways you self-sabotage, at the ways you give in to resistance and say, what is this giving me? How is this serving me? What is it telling me? And if I look at it really closely, what might 
I learn. And one of the things Pressfield says that we very often learn is that we're just afraid, right? We're, we're, we're afraid to go after that thing that we want to do. And so we give in to this addiction or this shadow calling instead. And Pressfield says, fear is the primary color of the amateur's inner world. Fear of failure, fear of success, fear of looking foolish, fear of underachieving and fear of overachieving, fear of poverty, fear of loneliness, fear of death. But mostly what we all fear as amateurs is being excluded from the tribe, the gang, the posse, mother and father, family, nation, race, religion. The amateur fears that if he turns pro and lives out his calling, he will have to live up to who he really is and what he is truly capable of. The amateur is terrified that if the tribe should discover who he really is, he will be kicked out into the cold to die. And often this comes from some original source of resistance coming from a member of the tribe, maybe an unsupportive parent, an unsupportive friend. It's some belief among in the people you are among that goes against what you want to do or what kind of work you want to commit yourself to. And so we are naturally afraid that if we go after that that calling, we will be kicked out of the tribe, we'll be left to, to starve in the cold. And so fear allows us to succumb to these addictions and to uh, these shadow callings. There's actually an interesting paradox here, which is that a professional actually takes themselves a little bit less seriously, whereas the amateur has overinflated their sense of self, and that is part of where their source of fear is coming from. The amateur's self-inflation prevents him from acting. He takes himself and the consequences of his actions so seriously that he paralyzes himself. But Pressfield points out something that has come up a number of times is that when we truly understand the tribe doesn't give a damn, we're free. There is no tribe and never was. Our lives are entirely up to us. The gang or posse that we imagine is sustaining us by the bonds we share is in fact just a conglomeration of individuals who are just as fucked up as we are and just as terrified. Each individual is so caught up in his own bullshit that he doesn't have two seconds to worry about yours or mine or to reject or diminish us because of it. No one is really thinking about you that much. No one really cares that much about what you do, what you're working on, what you're committed to. They're all wrapped up in their own lives and their own problems. They don't have time to think about you and yours. And that might feel a little depressing, but I, I think it's also very freeing, right? When you recognize that nobody cares that much about what you do, then you are kind of free to go do what is best for you. So how do we do it then? How do we become professionals? How do we stop being amateurs? How do we overcome resistance? How do we do our best work and defeat this self-destructive part of, of our brains that wants to hold us back? The thing that Pressfield really clarifies is that being professional is a habit. It is a lifestyle. It is something you are committed to. It's not merely a switch that you flip. It is something that you have to do and reaffirm to yourself every single day. And so he gives a lot of qualities of a professional and he gives some of those habits. And I'll just read a few of them because the list is kind of long. He says, professional shows up every day. Professional stays on the job all day. They're committed to the long haul. The stakes are high and real. They're patient. They seek order. They act in the face of fear. They accept new excuses. They're focused on mastering technique. They ask for help. They don't take failure or success personally. They endure adversity. They self-validate. They don't need validation from outside of themselves. They reinvent themselves and they're recognized by other professionals. They have peers. And there are a couple of more ideas that he goes a little bit more in depth on that I like. And one of these is that the professional does not wait for inspiration. He acts in anticipation of it. But this is definitely one of the big ones for creative work, feeling that you need some inspiration in order to write or paint or make music. But pretty much without fail, like one of the really constant themes when you study the lives of great creatives is that they just show up at the same time every day uh, and get to work. And then the inspiration follows from the habit. And a little later on, he gives uh, some last bit of advice with like really struggling with resistance in periods where it's particularly strong, because this is a lifelong project. It's something you're always going to have to work with and always going to be running into. It never goes away. It's just something that you get used to managing, dealing with, fighting with. He says, two key tenets for days when resistance is really strong. Take what you can get and stay patient. The defense may crack late in the game. Play for tomorrow. So having this patience, knowing that this is kind of going to be an ongoing battle, and if you just keep showing up, keep working against it, then it will, it will get weaker over time. And then there's a third tenet that underlies the first two. We are in this for the long haul. Simply being willing to take that longer view and be committed to it undermines a lot of the ways that our natural resistance wants to sabotage us. 
having that long-term vision, being very committed to it, really, really helps us to, to stand up in the face of it. If you're just listening, you can't see this, but you know, in the video, you can see a lot of these chapters are really short. They're, they're just a page or two, and each one provides some advice or some new perspective on it in an interesting way. So it's, it's a neat way of writing a book, right? It's a very different style of nonfiction. And it does have a lot of, I think, really great advice, really great tactical advice for doing what, what we've been talking about today, right? Recognizing this contradictory force in our life, this resistance that wants to hold us back, stop us from doing our best work, and then how we become professionals to overcome it, to, to sit down every day and push back against it uh, and do that best work and not let it overwhelm us, not let it stop us from living up to our best selves. So definitely pick up a copy of War of Art and Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. Uh, check out readwise.io slash nat for my favorite reading tool if you haven't already. And uh, if you're enjoying this show, please send it to a friend uh, or leave it a review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Like and subscribe on YouTube, kind of like all the usual things, you know the deal. Uh, but but really, if you can share it with a friend, that is the most helpful thing that you can do to make sure this, this podcast keeps growing and I keep working on it. Thank you, uh, as always, for listening, and I'll see you next week.